Greetings, everyone, and a very warm welcome to today's ISAT webinar. Um, we know how busy everyone is, so thank you for taking the time to join us today. I'm James Harvey, Communications Officer at ISAT, and I'm about to introduce you to our distinguished speaker, Giovanna Campello, who we are honoured to have with us here for the next hour to present highlights uh, from the uh, 2022 UNODC World Drug Report and she'll be here to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, we're very thankful to have Giovanna here, um, and uh, we'll be looking at some of the implications for drug prevention, treatment, and care responses. Uh, just a bit about ISAP. ISAP is an international membership organization, and we connect and provide knowledge and promote evidence-based uh, practice. Um, we have over 26,000 members worldwide, and uh, it's free to join. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar with our work, please head over to isip.net and uh, take a look at how to become a member. So the World Drug Report 2022 is gonna be our main focus for today's webinar. Uh, the report itself is a most important and remarkable piece of work, uh, not only because it gives an overview of trends and developments in the global drug situation, but it presents the most up-to-date global data and examines the practical implications for communities, individuals, and the environment at a time when the world is experiencing an increase in health and humanitarian crises. Uh, the webinar today is being recorded. You'll be able to submit any questions you may have uh, in the questions box in the webinar interface that's uh, on your screen at any time during the event. And today is your chance to put your questions directly to the chief of the UNODC Prevention, Treatment and Rehabilitation section. On to today's guest. Giovanna Campello has more than 25 years of experience with the UNODC in supporting member states and stakeholders at all levels in improving their drug prevention responses, whilst also contributing to scientific evidence. Notably in that context, Giovanna has led the publication of the International Standards of Drug Use Prevention in 2013 and the UNODC WHO second updated edition in 2018. Since 2016, Giovanna has been leading the UNODC Prevention, Treatment and Rehabilitation section, thus promoting evidence-based gender and human rights sensitive practice on prevention, treatment, care and rehabilitation, as well as working on the issue of access to controlled medicines. Giovanna, welcome to the webinar and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, James. Thank you so much for having me and thank you to the ISAP community for um, being so generous with your time and attention. Uh, it's a great honor to uh, present this remarkable piece of work like you were mentioning, James. Um, before I start, well, first of all, let's try and show my screen, which is always, you never know. <laughs> uh, let me take this one out. Um, I that cannot looks, see you anymore. Can you see it? Yeah, we can see you. your slide looks lovely on the screen. Um, before we start, I'd just like to remind the audience that live interpretation in Spanish is being provided throughout the session. Okay. So please um, follow the details that are posted in the chat where you can find the link and instructions on how to access that. Um, I'll hand the mic back over to you, Giovanna. Um, please take it away. Yes, no, uh, thank you. And uh, the first few points I will be, um, would be more generic to allow people to connect to the interpretation. Um, the first point uh, that I would like to make is that it's a great honor for me to present this uh, um, uh, this report to you, but of course this is only in minuscule part uh, the work of, of our team. This is the work of our colleagues in the research and analysis branch, and I would like to very much acknowledge that. Um, the other thing that I will have to say is that uh, I. Uh, taken the main findings of the report 
um, uh, as they have been distilled and summarized by the uh, entire UNODC together. But the report is so much richer. Even as I was preparing my notes, I wanted to double check a couple of details and I found so much more information and other bits and pieces of work of art, like I call them, uh, from the colleagues in the research analysis and research in the research analysis branch that I really, really invite you not to stop at listening to this um, to this uh, presentation, but really to go online and look at the different booklets because there is so much in there. Um, the other additional point and, uh, that uh, I would like to make is that although this is a summary, this is still going to be a long presentation with a lot of information. So um, please make yourself comfortable, grab yourself a cup of coffee or tea, a piece of cake, small ice cream, whatever you think about, uh, because uh, there is a lot to go through, uh, which I will try to do to the best of my abilities in an interesting way, but uh, there is no, denying that it's a lot of information in one go. Um, so here we go. Um, the first slide is the classic. These are the new statistics, the new overarching statistics. So um, one in every 18 people aged 15 to 64 worldwide used the drugs in the past 12 months. Uh, this is an estimated 284 million people. This is the new, uh, um, uh, the new overall statistics, or 5.6% of the population. This is data from 2020 because uh, the World Drug Report is the analysis is done in 2021 and then published beginning of 2022. So uh, we are the data is updated from year to year. And of those 284 people, here you go, 13% um, were people with drug use disorder. This is about 38.6 million or 0.76% of the population. Um, what I put also on this slide is a couple of points that pertains particularly to youth. So you have here that the majority of people being treated for drug use disorders in Africa and Latin America are under the age of 35. And that how young people typically report a higher level of drug use, 5.8% than to adults, 4.1%. And these are specifically data uh, regarding cannabis use and that in many countries drug use levels among young people are higher today than in past generations. I don't think there is any surprise for anybody there, but I think it's still striking to see it um, so nicely analyzed all together. And uh, this, uh, I, in, in this slide I put the overall big findings, but here there are the main findings as summarized in the um, in the in the report itself. So uh, let me start with the cocaine market. So as you know, the World Drug Report each year analyzes all of the markets for each of the main drugs, and the main finding of this analysis is this year is certainly the expansion of the cocaine market. Um, uh, there is a report of new record highs in manufacture and high level of use. Even if on the slide the uh, graphical elements provided in the report really report here on high levels of cultivation and production and here on the right how seizures are by now significant not in only in the so-called traditional markets but all over the world indicating an expansion of the market. Um, another thing that the report did this year is to go a bit more in depth with regard to which drug has the highest burden on the health of people. And in this uh, context, opioids, and you see them represented in 
um, orange in this slide in general. Remain the drugs with the highest burden on health, accounting for nearly 70% of the deaths, as well as of the loss of disability adjusted life years attributed to drug use disorders. Um, cannabis, however, accounts also for a substantial share of a global drug-related harm, which is in part due, of course, to the high prevalence rates, um, but also as the potency, um, no, um, and some 40% of countries reported cannabis as the drug related to the greatest number of drug use disorders. You see it here, there it is, and um, about 38%, uh, no, sorry, 33% reported it as the main drug for those in treatment. So definitely also cannabis linked to uh, um, high, um, uh, burden on, on the health of people. And also the other thing that of course you can see from this side on the right is that these on the left are global averages, but there are uh, significant regional differences. Um, so for example, as the potency of cannabis products has increased, together with regular and frequent cannabis use, cannabis use disorders and psychiatric comorbidities as have also risen in Western Europe. And cannabis use accounted for 31% of people who entered specialized drug treatment services in the European Union. These are data from 2019. While, for example, in East and Southeast Asia, we are here in Asia and Australia and New Zealand, it's amphetamine type stimulants, in particular methamphetamine, uh, that are the leading cause of people in drug treatment. Um, another, moving on from uh, the related, the harmfulness of the different substances, um, another very interesting analysis this year is with regard to gender. And uh, the large majority of people who use drugs do continue to be men. And you might remember that um, there was a very nice analysis done by the World Drug Report a few years back that was on average uh, uh, showing how one person that uses these drugs in three is a woman. But still, um, um, this year what the, the colleagues have done is to do a more in-depth analysis and here you can see an analysis by uh, selected drug groups. And so for example on opioids and cocaine and even cannabis you definitely see how the majority of people that use are men. But uh, still there is 40%, about 40% um, of people who use amphetamine type stimulants or use uh, non-medically pharmaceutical stimulants, pharmaceutical opioids, sedatives and tranquilizer are women. Look here. Um, uh, so the gender, uh, so there is, why there is an imbalance, pic the picture is different according to substance. And this gender gap is narrowing in some cases. Um, and this, uh, you can see this in the graphical elements here on the right, showing how the uh, gender gap in the case of cannabis in the United States, where use is particularly high, has narrowed a lot. Um, the other uh, um, analysis that the colleagues did was instead of by drugs, by uh, a region. And uh, this is, uh, again, cannabis. And certainly, again, you can see um, 
as I was mentioning before, there are regional differences. There are regions in which the vast majority of people that use are men. Look at the, the, the data from Asia here or for Africa. But there are um, significant uh, population of women that use in other regions and uh, um, that would deserve our attention. Um, Another I think that has not changed, depressingly so, is the gender gap in the provision of treatment. You might remember that the colleagues, uh, um, the World Drug Report a few years back, had uh, created a very nice graphical element that I've used so many times in which one person that uses drugs in three is a woman, but only one person in five that is in treatment is, is a woman. And look at some updated figures here at the bottom with regard to amphetamine users. So even though almost one in two amphetamine user is a woman, less than one in five person in treatment for amphetamines is a woman. So I think that this analysis is something that really should spur us all into action to address uh, this uh, enormous, this what I call the double gap in the gender provision, uh, in, in the treatment provision of, uh, for, for women, um, especially considering that although less women use drugs than men, they do progress to drug use disorder and more severely faster. Um, moving on, um, you might uh, know that every year the World Drug Report has almost like a monograph on a specific issue with regard to drugs uh, uh, worldwide. And the issue that has been uh, analyzed um, in particular uh, depth this year is the impact of the production of, it, of, of illicit drugs on the environment. And uh, of course, we cannot claim that uh, the impact of illicit drugs on the environment is significant at the global level, but um, the examples from research show that the effects can be significant in terms of um, at the local or community level. And some of the examples that are discussed in the report are really fascinating. So here, for example, on the left, you see a representation of the example of uh, deforestation, uh, given that illicit drug crop cultivation often takes place in fragile ecosystems that have a protective status, such as national park and forest reserves, and it can act as a driver or catalyst of deforestation. And, um, in some cases, the deforestation associated with illicit coca cultivation. This is, uh, um, uh, these are data from uh, research in Colombia, can be really substantial. Another example is uh, with regard to the chemical waste that is produced during the manufacturing of synthetic drugs. And uh, in some communities, really, the impact can be substantial because the uh, waste generated um, during the synthesis process of synthetic drugs such as amphetamines, uh, methamphetamines and MDMA is between five and 30 times the volume of the end product. Um, and uh, if there is use of pre-precursor or pre-pre-precursors because the illicit manufacturers cannot uh, put their hands on the normal precursors because of the controls. Um, this increases the amount of waste and the dumping and discharge of waste created in drug manufacturers can have an impact on the soil, on the water, on the air and have indirect effects on organisms, animals and the food chain. Um, in addition, of course, the cleaning of seized synthetic drug-related waste or storage site or manufacturing laboratories is not only costly for the community, but can create risk for public safety. 
Um, another fascinating analysis in this sense is with regard to the carbon footprint um, of the production of different drugs. So uh, look here on the left, uh, we have um, um, uh, an example of how available studies suggest that the supply chains have a large carbon footprint impact per quantity produced compared to the production of alternative crops. And you can see here how uh, one kilogram of cocaine has a carbon footprint that is 30 times greater than one kilogram of cocoa beans. And here on the right, um, you have an analysis of the carbon footprint of cannabis grown indoors, which mainly due to its energy use um, is uh, on average 16 to 100 times greater than that of outdoor cannabis, which is in turn higher than other energy intensive food crops. So I think that that uh, is um, really interesting and fascinating analysis on how maybe on the aggregate level, as I mentioned, uh, the um, impact on the environment of uh, um, uh, the illicit production of drugs is not uh, so remarkable, but at local level, when we look into it, it can be really significant indeed. Um, the report has also includes an analysis of the impact um, of cannabis legalization. Um, and uh, there is also, which I've not reported on this slide, a very a nice um, trying to make a, a, a part that makes uh, that tries to make a bit of order uh, into uh, the many different kind of provisions that go under the name cannabis legalization, because some member states have legalized the can cannabis for medical use or cannabis products for medical use. Some others have, uh, have legalized um, um, the non-medical use of cannabis. Some have simply depenalized. And so the report does try to paint a, a more precise picture with this in this regard. But here, what I'm, I'm showing is various impacts um, of uh, the legalization of uh, non-medical cannabis. And this appears to have accelerated the upward trends in reported daily use of cannabis with a pronounced increase in reported frequent use of high potency products among young adults. Okay, I'm being told that my network connection may be too slow. I hope it's okay. I'm ignoring this message. Um, what the picture says is that um, I think on one hand, the, the data shows that the prevalence of cannabis use among adolescents has not changed much. However, the proportion of people with psychiatric disorders and suicide associated with regular cannabis use has increased, as has the number of hospitalization due to cannabis use disorders. Um, cannabis products have diversified a lot, and average levels of THC in the various cannabis products have continued to increase, so higher potency, to levels up to 60% in some markets. Um, the growing influence and investment of large corporations, including those in the alcohol tobacco sector, is evident in the legal cannabis industry. And on one hand, the, legal, the tax revenues from the legalized markets have continued to rise. Um, and while, but at the same time, they, while the legal market is shrinking in some jurisdictions, it does continue to exist along the legal, legal markets. Uh, the World Drug Report also shows how legalization has led to a major reduction in the number and rates of arrest of people for cannabis-related offenses, 
Of course, this is as a result that, uh, this is my comment, that could have, have, have been achieved through the provision of alternatives to conviction and punishment. Um, and however, the report notes that since the possession of cannabis remains a criminal offense for minors, legalization has not led to a substantial reduction in youth arrest rates. And again, this is uh, maybe a, um, a, a, um, a place where we can look more uh, seriously at the uh, provision for of treatment and services as alternatives to conviction and punishment to address um, the issue of um, the uh, youth arrest rates. Um, still, let's move on uh, to another uh, uh, main finding from the World Drug Report of this year, which is an analysis of lessons learned from past and current conflicts on the consequences of conflicts on drug markets. Um, and I think that from, um, in general, what we see, we have seen from past experience is the fact that illicit drug economies can flourish in situation of conflict and weak rule of law, and they can in turn prolong and fuel the conflict. Um, plant, for example, plant-based drugs such as cocaine and opiates have been used in the past by parties to finance conflict. Uh, Colombia, Afghanistan come up as an example very easily. Um, and parties to a conflict have also used the illicit drug trade to generate income by levying taxes on the drug trade, for example, in the Sahel. Um, information from the Middle East and Southeast Asia suggests that conflict situation can act as a magnet for the manufacture of synthetic drugs, which can be manufactured anywhere. They are not linked to a particular uh, uh, geographical area for cultivation. And this effect may be even greater when the conflict area is near large consumer markets. Finally, conflicts may also disrupt and shift uh, drug trafficking routes. Uh, we saw that during the Yugoslav wars with heroin trafficking routes through the Balkans being disrupted. And more recently in Ukraine, we have some accounts suggesting that drug trafficking may have decreased since uh, already since early 2022. And building on this, the um, uh, the um, World Drug Report tries to analyze uh, future developments in the global opiate market, uh, which will largely depend on the situation and what will happen in Afghanistan, given that Afghanistan accounted for 86% of illicit opium production in 2021. Um, global opium production has followed a long-term upward trend over the past two decades, and in 2021, production was up 7% from the previous years because uh, there had been higher opium uh, yields in Afghanistan. Now, the 2021 harvest took place uh, from April to June, so before the takeover by the de facto Taliban authorities in August. On one hand, we have a socioeconomic conditions faced by the people in Afghanistan who are experiencing a prolonged humanitarian crisis. And this uh, is very easy to think how it may act as an incentive to increase illicit uh, uh, opium poppy cultivation. And we have seen opium prices that have risen since the beginning of August 2021. Um, now we have recently uh, um, the de facto uh, Taliban authority have announced a, um, a ban on opium coffee cultivation production and use in April 2022. And we will remain to see uh, its application and enforcement and therefore its um, impact on the level of production. 
but you have seen that uh, you can see from this slide how our my colleagues in the research and analysis branch even before all of this happened had tried to analyze possible scenarios um, that uh, that could be linked to a production increase a stable production or a production decrease um, of course it's too early to know what uh, the um, effect of the uh, um, ban on opium poppy cultivation production and use will be in Afghanistan. I just would like to remind ourselves what happened uh, decades ago in the um, uh, when the first uh, Taliban uh, um, government banned opium poppy and how the crash in opium production led to an increase in harmful uh, patterns of use in Afghanistan and all around Afghanistan and on the um, on all, in all of the country that are normally affected uh, uh, by the um, by the production in uh, in Afghanistan so uh, more harmful use and there was a shift to uh, the use of amphetamine type stimulants um, for which the services which were already not very strong were ill-prepared now it is hope we have all been working for many years since to um, strengthen uh, uh, drug treatment and prevention system um, all over the world so i'm hoping that in the case of a production decrease in afghanistan um, all of the treatment services are better prepared to cope with an increase in people with uh, a more harmful pat pattern of use or moving from op the use of opioids to the use of stimulants but we all know about the treatment gap and so i think that this is something we should all start to prepare for um, there is um, the World Drug Report also ha um, um, has a very interesting, at least to my mind, also this is not my usual field of work, analysis of the evidence of impact of uh, um, different ways of eradicating uh, illicit drug crops. Um, of course, uh, in general, there is uh, not much data, there is not much research, but we have a precious piece of research from Colombia matching difference in different analysis to estimate the effects of forced and voluntary eradication on coca, coca cultivation in the country. And this is represented in this slide. So, on one hand, here you can see how forced eradication resulted in an initial decrease in illicit drug crop cultivation due to the direct removal of the bush. It's gone. However, subsequently, cultivation increased at higher rate than in similar areas where no forced eradication took place. And over the next 10 years, this eradication gain is quite projected to disappear altogether. And this suggests that a one-off forced eradication yields no real long-term benefits. On the contrary, look here on um, what happened in the case of voluntary eradication conducted in coordination with alternative development intervention. So at the beginning, there was even an increase in cultivation. This is due to this perverse incentive effect because some farmers may begin to cultivate illicitly drug crops because they want to participate in the alternative development project. But over time, illicit drug crop cultivation decreased at a greater rate in areas where voluntary eradication and alternative development than in areas without. And this eradication gain is now projected to continue increasing over the next decade. I find this um, really fascinating research which has very uh, strong uh, policy implication for all of us. 
Um, another uh, piece of uh, uh, research um, that the, uh, the World Drug Report has looked into is, of course, the impact of the pandemic. You might remember that already last year, um, the, uh, the World Drug Report had done an initial analysis of the impact of the pandemic on use, on trafficking, on the responses. But now, two years in the pandemic, really, we had some consolidated uh, um, uh, information that is presented on these slides, and that I can summarize as follows. So, on one hand, we have some pattern or use, those that were heavily dependent on a social situation, such as used by adolescents and used in entertainment venues, that did decrease during lockdown, sometimes dramatically, people were just not getting together. But the decrease was short-lived. And moreover, moreover, there are signs that some drug use patterns may have become more harmful during the pandemic. Uh, so we have that uh, data that, uh, drug, that shows that the frequency of use and quantities had increased while the number of users remained relatively stable. Um, so I think that, again, we see that people with drug use disorders that are more vulnerable and they are not, uh, they need uh, services to uh, be in recovery in a situation where they cannot, the, of stress and where they cannot access services they, their, uh, their pattern of use will become more, more harmful. And we, did, we do have indications that there was less access to services. Um, data showed the short, shortage in drug treatment provision during 2020 in all regions. And I will add, it's not on the slide, but I will add, this was in spite of the commitment and the ingenuity of the community that tried the best possible and all sorts of innovative way to ensure the continuity of services. We had services uh, reported, re you know, provided remotely, self-paced by computers, take-home medications, medication delivered at home, still in spite of all of this really commendable effort from the service community. I had, we saw that the access to services did decrease. Um, and therefore, should come, it should come as no surprise that relapse increased in several countries during the pandemic, and the women who use drugs who were already at a disadvantage before the pandemic may have been disproportionately affected by it. Um, still, um, there, were, there was some innovation and it would be important to study this innovation better and to keep all of these lessons learned in mind to, be, uh, to organize ourselves, especially the services, to be better prepared if, hopefully not, but if a new uh, crisis should present itself. Um, with regard to the, um, I was mentioning to the um, uh, analysis of various markets, I already mentioned something about cocaine, I already mentioned something about the opiate market and its uh, dependence on what will matter, will happen in, uh, in Afghanistan. The only additional analysis that I will add is with regard to the men methamphetamine market. Um, given that we have some evidence that uh, methamphetamine manufacturer abuse uh, have continued to expand be beyond what are considered the more traditional market that you can see here um, in East and Southeast Asia and North America. Uh, we have an expansion, uh, most notably in Southwest Asia and in Latin America. So, first of all, methamphetamine manufacture and use have risen in Afghanistan in recent years, and the drug is being trafficked to the wider region. Accounts suggest that the use of methamphetamine and captagon tablets is rising in Southwest Asia and beyond, particularly in Iraq, and seizures in the Gulf suggest that a methamphetamine market may emerge there too. 
and moving to Latin America, the dramatic expansion of the methamphetamine market is illustrated in Mexico, where treatment admission for the drugs have outnumbered those of alcohol and where people entering treatment for methamphetamine use disorder increased to 20, 218 percent between 2013 and 2020. It's a huge time bracket but it's also a huge uh, um, a, a huge expansion of a new kind of use. Um, moreover, seizures of the drug and its growing popularity among some user groups suggest that the methamphetamine market is also expanding in Western and Central Europe with clandestine laboratories that are becoming bigger and are manufacturing larger quantities. Um, a, the market of Captagon is something very particular. Captagon is an illicit manufactured substance containing various concentrations of amphetamines and it continues to flourish in the near and Middle East with re seizures reaching a record high in 2020. So the departure point for trafficking continues to be in the Levant. So we have the Syrian Arab Republic and Lebanon. You can see it here on the map with destination in Gulf countries that are reached either directly by land and sea or indirectly through Europe and possibly North Africa. But recent figures, seizures in East Asia and West Africa point to further geographical expansion of the Captagon market also there. Um, so I, I hope I have, uh, still have you. Uh, it's a bit difficult for me here to um, go, gouge exactly how, what is going on in your mind, um, uh, uh, just staring at, at the slide. Um, here uh, with this, I finish my uh, um, uh, tour de force, tour de France, tour de Italy um, of uh, um, of uh, of um, uh, main findings. James, if you give me five more minutes, if it's possible, I would go through some policy implications. Some I've already mentioned along the way, um, but I think uh, and and this policy implication that I'm presenting are from the World Drug Report itself. Um, uh, although I will not present them all, um, but you're of course more than invited to uh, look at them for them for yourself. And you will notice a lot of exclamation mark. That was me and my colleague Asli preparing this presentation and getting maybe a bit excited about all that it needs to be done. Um, and uh, um, but I think that I think you we have all. Um, some very important public implication on the provision of a good range of evidence-based services to protect and enhance the health of people who use and people with drug use disorders, giving them all of the choices and supporting their recovery. Um, I think there is no uh, um, way around it, especially ensuring that services are humane. I would find avoid punishment and stigmatization and are based on good quality. Uh, there is more to that, but uh, um, I am trying to be brief. What I would like to underline that collectively as a community, we have the tools. I have put here some tools with other standards, our work on quality, on overdose, UTC, our work on family therapy, uh, the work uh, on uh, uh, for people in, the, in contact with the criminal justice system and prison settings. I'm sure I'm not covering everything. We just need to get our uh, forces joined together to do better and more. And this is similar to the point that I was mentioning before, the fact that there seems to be a continuous underrepresentation of women in treatment. And we know what needs to be done. We just need to expand gender sensitive services. And here there is a small summary, but we all know that we have very strong tools to uh, improve uh, services for girls and women 
and uh, expand research in the uh, risk and protective factors that may put girls and women more at risk of starting to use drugs or progressing to drug use disorders um, and so improve that prevention response as well. We saw things, uh, we saw a lot on uh, cannabis legalization and how and uh, levels of uh, um, use in youth. Um, I think that this completely points to the need for more research and more prevention. And uh, um, I think that here we have the tools. What I would like to bring to the attention of everybody is the fact that the Commission of Narcotic Drugs uh, last March um, passed a very strong resolution on the need to invest in evidence-based prevention at an early age, really going very early and making sure that children and youth development is healthy and safe and really protect um, children and youth from starting to use and to starting any other risky behavior as well. Um, we have uh, needs to work in humanitarian settings and you know that as UNODC we have developed strong tools in prevention and we are developing some more on treatment. I think that as a community we can uh, join forces to do more and make sure that uh, the issue of substance use and drug use is uh, addressed uh, in humanitarian settings as well. Um, we have seen an analysis on the impact on the drugs on the environment as a, being significant. Of course, we as a community are more working on drug prevention, treatment, care, uh, recovery, and so on. And so, of course, uh, the analysis that our colleagues did has very strong implication of um, mainstreaming the objective or do no harm to the environment in drug policies responses at all levels. And I think we can all contribute to that. But I also have a small idea which we can think about and we can sure, surely test those who know me uh, know that I am fixated about evaluation. And, but I'm thinking, you know, um, whether we could use the results of this analysis to feed them into a persuasive campaign among environmentalist conscious youth with a view to prevention. Just to uh, underline how and raise awareness how drug use is not. Uh, environmentally neutral at all and of course you notice here the word of the uh, the word persuasive which I'm using completely on purpose because we all uh, what I'm referring to is the science that uh, has been popularized of course uh, uh, um, by our colleague uh, um, Professor William Crano um, in the United States but in general in the in the psychology science that tells us how to build persuasive messages and how much research needs to go into development of any campaign but I'm thinking that that might be a venue they worth exploring with very strong research. Um, what else? I only have one thing in conclusion that I think comes out very strongly from this uh, um, overview of the main findings of the World Drug Report of this year. And to me, what the reading, the main findings, what really spoke to me is the fact that our work as a community that uh, protects and enhances the health of people at risk of starting to use drugs, people who use drugs already, people with drug use disorders, and the people that need access to control substances is more relevant than ever and that we have a lot of tools and we just need to join forces together and and this is of course is a wonderful um, platform to do so there may be others but we can start from here to uh, increase uh, the effectiveness and impact of um, and even coverage, I would say, and, and resources um, of our work. 
And with this, I thank you for your kind attention. And I um, open the floor. Well, I open the floor. I give the floor back to James, who has promised to moderate a question and answer session. And I will try to the best of my abilities to uh, respond to any queries you might have. Thank you very much, Giovanna. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation and uh, a very powerful and positive call to action at the end there um, for everybody to join forces to meet the challenges that, that the world is facing today. Um, we're going to field some of the questions kindly submitted from the audience. Uh, we've got lots of questions coming in and unfortunately I'm going to have to use uh, my prerogative as chair to uh, just pick a few of those um, because we've only got 10 minutes left um, of this session. Um, our first questions are, are going to be on gender. One of the okay. big what one of the big stories in this year's World Drug Report is that women continue to be underrepresented in, in treatment and you yeah. highlighted the need for more gender sensitive services. Um, the question is sort of two parts. Is there a knowledge gap here uh, that research can fill? And is, is, is more research needed to help us gain a better understanding overall of the role of sex and gender in pathways to drug use? And the second part of the question is, um, could you maybe run through what, what gender sensitive services for women actually look like in practice? Uh, hey, well, I mean, uh, it is difficult to be, to be quick. Um, we understand this. Yes, well. there is a, there is a need. So yes, there is a need for um, for more research. That's for sure. And particularly as you were mentioning about the pathways, and and how this can uh, and how and this will inform better responses on prevention. We don't have a lot of evidence of what works best. Um, uh, for uh, females and males, uh, women and men, girls and boys in prevention. But I want to be a bit blunt here. We should not hide behind the lack of research. There is sufficient evidence about what works to support uh, the path to recovery and the health of women who use drugs and women with drug use disorder. And we can use that. And we should not wait for more research. And uh, you can find uh, a good summary on that slide that I shared in the World Drug Report and above all in our standards uh, uh, that we have published together with WHO. But in general, it's about simply make sure that the services actually meets the need um, of women, which are often around safety and feeling safe and uh, safe and being safe are often around uh, trauma informed care so care that takes into account every step of the way that the majority of women reporting to uh, treatment services have been the victims of violence and abuse and this needs to be taken into account of course, uh, um, take into account their um, probable uh, childcare responsibility and support them in their childcare responsibilities as opposed to threatening to take the family away and, and, and so on. And, and of course, uh, being very cognizant, this goes for both men and women, uh, although in the case of women, there might, be, uh, there might be a difference in the response to comorbid mental health disorders that are very prevalent indeed. These are only some basic points because, of course, uh, I, I want to be cognizant of time. But I think that there is sufficient evidence to really start um, start working, particularly in the case of treatment services. And whoever says, oh, we need more research is searching for an excuse. Um, in terms of treatment services, we know enough okay, let's do it with quality, let's do it with evaluation, let's do it with more research, but we can act now. Thank you. Um, Tony Rao uh, asks uh, a question about um, older people, the older demographic, um, and he asks, ah. has, there been, has there been a more rapid 
rise observable in drug use amongst older people compared to, with other generations over the past 20 years or so? A uh, very quick answer. I don't know. There might have been. And uh, we have been talking with, uh, uh, with the colleagues uh, uh, of the research and analysis branch to uh, what, do, what they call a deep dive. So to analyze specifically um, data on senior citizens and the people above um, 65. I mean, the general population, adult population is normally considered uh, 15 to uh, 64. Um, and I remember seeing uh, um, 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 data to this effect, particularly for high income countries, but I don't want to venture into a, a, a yes or no answer or even a qualified answer because uh, I, I've not seen a comprehensive analysis done yet, but it's certainly something that uh, that is on our list to do. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if you could just, uh, you mentioned at the start of the webinar that um, uh, your, re your research team handles most of the evidence gathering and synthesis for the report. Um, and just looking at this year's report, the number of references is incredible. There's such an That's impressive great. and rich amount of um, sources contained in the report. I was just wondering, um, how do you sort of quality assure that process of pulling together all of that evidence, because obviously it's not just um, government data that goes into it. There's such a wide yeah. range of sources. Um, how, how do you put it together in such a short period of time? Well, uh, for my colleagues, it's really every, every year a miracle. So they have by now uh, perfect, they are perfecting a good system. Um, of course, they have uh, government data um but of course that is not enough and they uh, monitor the evidence on a continuous basis and they input everything the, and um, so they um, do quality check for you know data on prevalence and so on and when the data is considered good uh, methodologically it is inputted in a mega database <laughs> from which they do the analysis that i presented to you um, but they're not doing this alone they have a few years back already this has been going for quite some time uh, created a scientific um, advisory group that uh, checks the methodology and uh, uh, spot checks uh, the quality of the um, uh, of the way the data has been handled and presented so that uh, they have that external feedback and uh, um, and uh, they are they, they can be more reassured about uh, about the, the, the quality of their methodology. This is for their ongoing analysis of the markets of the use or sometimes when they look into let's look at the more 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 closely at the data on use by young people or let's look more closely at the data for use among women that I presented this year and then of course there are the monographs in that in that in that sense then they rely on their network of researchers some of, one of which will do a systematic review of the evidence on a certain topic for example uh, what I presented on environment and of course the results of, and uh, of the um, of the research will also be overlooked by the scientific advisory committee so they work on, on on two strands and indeed every year they pull together an enormous amount of uh, complex information and they digest it for us so let's use it <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much um, uh, we've only got a couple of minutes left so we're going to draw the session to a close thank you Giovanna for those uh, for the great presentation wonderful answers to our questions and as always it's been a real pleasure to have you with us today um i just wanted to give you the opportunity to sort of like close the webinar with 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 with, with a final thought um is there anything that you'd really like the drug demand reduction community to take away from this year's report to think about and to just um to, to keep at the front of our minds um to energize our 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 work around the world 
Well, first of all, thank you for giving me this 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 opportunity and um, and it's always a bit difficult to be to have the last concluding words. I, I think that and I don't want to be prescriptive. I saw many people online, like almost 400, and there will be people with different fields of work and interest. My plea is what I just said, let's use uh, this data. If you look in the World Drug Report, there is bound to be a piece of information, a nice uh, graphical element that you can use in your advocacy to, uh, um, uh, to advocate for increased resources for prevention, for evidence-based prevention, for evidence-based treatment, and gosh knows, you know, there is a lot of need, the gaps are staggering. And of course, the final parting word is also, let's connect to each other, you know, let's not, uh, today you were just listening to me, talking for a long time, but many of us know each other, it's a Bring, bring puts a platform at your disposal let us connect so that you are not the only small voice in the desert waving a piece of information for advocacy but you join forces with other voices and you become a roar to in uh, uh, to increase resources for evidence-based prevention and treatment thanks Giovanna um we're out of time. Uh, I'd just like to say that if you would like to read the World Drug Report 2022, it's available on the UNODC website. Um, and a lot of the tools that you saw in Giovanna's slides are also available on the UNODC Prevention, Treatment and Re Rehabilitation section uh, website for free. Um, thank you to everybody who joined us. A link to the recording will be circulated in an email after the event. Uh, please explore our YouTube channel for the full range of ISAT webinars, including more from Giovanna, UNODC and experts from around the world who are also working on substance use prevention, treatment and recovery support issues. If you've not done so already, uh, do head over to the ISAT website, isap.net, where you're going to find loads, uh, lots of information on our work and how to become a member. Uh, and finally, for those of you who are watching the recording, please don't forget to uh, like and subscribe if you have enjoyed the session. Um, and thank you for joining us. Uh, see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.